Welcome to RaiderCast, the Tomb Raider podcast that delves into the myths and mysteries of Lara's world. Happy Angel of Darkness month. This is going to be a really special episode. Not only am I happy to reveal that Crystal Dynamics Tomb Raider community manager Megan Marie will be joining me for this and for some future episodes as RaiderCast in partnership with Tomb Raider, but today we'll be joined by not one, not two, not three, but four special guests from the core design development team who we'll be talking to about the development of the Angel of Darkness. Yeah, and I'm going to sit here and I'm going to I'm going to sing the praise of Chris and Raidercast here. We're really excited to collaborate with him because he does such great work and this is a way for us to team up and we can get some cool behind the scenes content and interviews and set up all that stuff and he can, you know, add it to his awesome format and of course Chris will still have his his sort of regular solo Raider cast episodes, but we'll have some more collaboration ones in the future, which is very exciting. All right, should we get started with the interview? We have four amazing, talented people here we're super excited to talk about. Please welcome Richard Morton, Murty Schofield, Peter Connolly, and Jero Carroll. Welcome to Raidercast. Welcome, Hello. everyone. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. If you guys could please introduce yourselves, how long has it actually been since you last talked to each other? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I work with Jer, so I see him every day on Skype. So I've worked uh, together for about, what, four years now, is it, Jer? Something like that? Yeah. Um, Obviously, previously, core design, and you know, you can't get rid of me. So, <laughs> I've not spoke to Pete for a while. Um, I've spoke it's been to a Mert- while, yeah. It has been ages, hasn't it? Um, yeah. I spoke to, to Murti a few times just over, um, you know, Facebook or, or LinkedIn. But yeah, um, Jerry is the only one that I've really kept in contact with. Um, so, yeah, that's me. That's exciting. All right, Jared, do you want to introduce yourself and, and um, what you did at Core? I'm Jero Carroll. I did animation at Core and on Angel Darkness. I was, I was doing Curtis most of the time. As for the other guys, I mean, like I said, Richard, Richard got me onto Tomb Raider first when I first got on Tomb Raider. So eventually I paid him for the back and I got him to where we're working now together. So dues are paid now. We're, we're even now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot to tell, I forgot to say what I did. It. Core as well. I, I was the lead game designer on it, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> game design, no biggie. Um, I spoke to Pete a while ago, um, but just like on Skype or something, just a few quick chats here and there. And I haven't spoken or seen Murty for yonks until about last week. And I've got him on Facebook now, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Pete Connolly um, on Angel of Darkness and uh, pre- a couple of two years before that, I'm involved with uh, as a composer and sound designer. On Angel Darkness, I was primarily involved with, along with Martin Iverson, on the composing of the, the music. Um, and we also both work with cutscenes and SFX as well. Um, with regards to the guys, I mean, apart from Murty, I've not really seen Jer or um, Rich since I left Core Design, you know? It's like, but it just feels like, yeah. it feels like them 18 years have not passed. It just feels like yesterday, you know, when I yeah. see them and when I chat them, it's just like, it's just taken over from the last time I spoke. Well, I, so I see you every week on Facebook trying to sell cars, to be honest. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got to stop selling cars. I know. I'm, I'm Murty Schofield, or I was last time I looked. And um, <laughs> yeah, I joined Core in 2000, worked on um, story, character, back history, um, plot lines for three years. Um, and yeah, had a, had a great time, had a great time at first, but then it became um, problematic towards the end. And um, I've kept in touch with Pete fairly regularly, uh, too often, really, uh, for common sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit much. Awesome. Well, you guys each talked about it briefly, but I want to expand on your roles during AOD and, and, and like basically how you rolled on. So again, we'll start with you, Richard. Um, so when did you roll off of the previous Tomb Raider games onto AOD and like, what was the day to day like in your role? If I remember correctly, um, I was working on, um, Last Revelation, um, as like the game designer and, uh, level designer. Um, and we had this stupid idea of going in to Jeremy and saying, uh, cause we didn't know how to end the game. So we thought, oh, you know, we'll just kill Lara. 
So, <laughs> you know, as you do. So we went into Jeremy's office and he immediately uh, told us to get out. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then invited us back in and, and actually said yeah that's that's actually quite a good idea um but we don't want tomb raider to end so what what do we do um yeah so we i can't remember if murty was there at that point or if it was after but i know we managed to thread it into angel of darkness as the follow-on from that and and to show how laura didn't die Mm -hmm. and how she got rescued and obviously huge chunks of Angel of Darkness got cut that showed Laura being rescued and being trained up and, and having all this extra cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's a real shame that didn't make it. Um, but yeah, the, the, the upshot of that is that we had to do another um, PlayStation 1 Tomb Raider game, which mm -hmm. ended up being Chronicles, which was like a, you know, sequel story, uh, prequel stories, should I say. Mm -hmm. Um so most of the PlayStation 1 Tomb Raider team stayed and did Chronicles. And Murty and uh, some other guys, um, including like Mark Donald, um, actually went and started doing some preliminary like, work on Angel of Darkness. And you know, obviously the story, most of that was written before I even joined the oh, team. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't join until like a year. In, I think if your memory serves you you're right okay um, and then yeah once once on it um, we we tweaked a few things we we added a few more tombs uh, unfortunately the the project had to get basically cut in half uh, the reason why you can see a lot of the uh, environments like Castle Kriegler and Turkey is because they were built early on as prototypes for mm -hmm. what was originally going to be the second half of the game. And then we just had to chop chop that off and not not use it all because we realised it was getting too big. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we made half of the game basically. Yeah, and we do have a lot of that we will be able to show, which is exciting. We've been digging up those assets. So for you, Jer, um, when did you roll on to AOD, and what was your day to day like? You said you focused primarily on Curtis animations. Yeah, I'm, I listened to what Richard's saying just now. Again, I forgot a lot of this to be honest, and I can't remember when I actually went onto it as well. I know Mark was doing the Lara. And Mark just come in, a very talented animator, so he took on Lara. And then I just moved on to Curtis. And I just remember spending a lot of time just doing very, very simple animations because we were going to try and do a male version of Lara, but she had a mm -hmm. huge backlog of animations to go through. And everything. So that, that started out. And then, you know, once we got the bulk of the, the basic movements done, we started moving into all the fancy ones and extra ones and things you could do and having certain powers and stuff. And We'll go into it later on that, but there's a whole class of stuff that was done for him, which didn't actually make the game at the end of the day, which was a bit of a shame, but it was a lot done. We're going to surface them now, though. We'll give them the moment in, in the sun. There we go. So many cool animations Same that you did for him. <laughs> um, I mean, how about for you, Peter? Um, I, I think I rolled on to Angel of Darkness immediately after Hurdy Gurdy. I don't know if you remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the first game I worked on, and then the music I wrote for that. I kind of did a little collage of, you know, a couple of ideas, prototypes, what would be in the game. And Jeremy could quite like the music. He says, oh, do you want to work on a Tomb Raider 4? And I was like, no. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> basically I went to Tomb Raider 4, Tomb Raider 5 naturally led on from that. And then I finished off Hurdy Gurdy. And then I went straight over Angel of Darkness. And um, from then on, it was just, a, you know, it was between me and Martin Iverson, which was a great collaboration because it was a pretty intense project. Yeah. from the sound point of view you know it was um it, you know it, it wasn't just like two ps1 audio chips you know it, it, it was it, it was exponential you know the amount of work that I needed to do to it to get it kind of on that platform yeah. um and obviously the first thing we discussed as well was how we would work the music out and we basically came up with a list okay with like the london symphony orchestra it abbey road down to like kind of like peter lee jr you know, yeah. whatever, in my studio. <laughs> and, yeah. and Jeremy just went, yeah, go with the top two. We were like, okay. So obviously then we realised, you know, we've got a lot of work on here. So we kind of spent the next three months creating the music and getting it kind of into a... We didn't have to overproduce it, so it sounded real. We just had to kind of write the notes so that the orchestra could take it and put it into notation. But that was it. It was a pretty intense project. I remember practically living at the, 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 the offices, you know, <laughs> towards the last six months. I even had a camp bed in my room, I remember. I've um, heard that. So, 
I would crash out at four in the morning and I would be woke up half half nine the next morning to carry on. It you just got it was just a way of life. You you just got on with it. I mean, thankfully I was single back then, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How that's interesting. And then Murdy, how about when did so when did you actually roll onto the project, Murdy? Um and, and what was the day-to-day like for you? Uh well I've got very clear memories. <laughs> <laughs> I um I I I, I joined in, in July. Oh. <laughs> I joined in July of 2000 um, mm-hmm. and there'd been a team together comprising, as I understood it at that time, of Pete and Mark and James Kenny, yeah. who'd been working on ideas. Yeah. But then I'd, I'd um, I, 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 as I understood it again, because I wasn't there, um, they'd sort of, um, they couldn't seem to agree on stuff. So I came in in July um, and started bringing the ideas that I'd got. Um, and yeah, it, it went from there. Um, and I can remember um, Rich joining, and I can remember Jay joining, and, and, and you know, yeah. variously all, all the other people. Because I was completely new to the company in July. I didn't know anybody except an old friend, Jeremy Oldreeve, that I'd worked with at Cygnosis in Chester. Uh, so, you know, I had to get to know the team and get to know people. And um, I didn't see Jeremy um jeremy smith until i'd been there about three or four months and his opening his opening to me was hello what is it you actually do for us <laughs> um, <laughs> he just didn't know and and i thought oh he's joking and then i realized he wasn't <laughs> he was actually dead so um so I, I tried to tell him and um and I, I dealt with Adrian after that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, Adrian uh, understood more because Adrian had been the person who'd interviewed me in in mm. uh, in May, uh, yeah. in June. He'd interviewed me in June, yeah. and he was the one who'd asked me, um, "We want to we want to break some new ground. We want to go into some new areas. We want to introduce a playable character. We want something that might go for three games." And I said, "Well, I, I can do that for you." Um, I've, I've got loads of ideas and I outlined a lot of the ideas and, and basically on the spot he said well when can you start so um, yeah two weeks later I turned oh. up and uh, and Jeremy uh, uh, you know I didn't see Jeremy but when I when I turned up um, Adrian came up and he said oh oh you're here already oh right I said well yes you said it's Monday you know <laughs> I'm here <laughs> but it, yeah it was it was great and it was very it was especially good working with Rich because Rich was which Rich was my sort of connection and interpreter, if you like, to all the the gameplay stuff. Because I hadn't done I hadn't designed gameplay before. I'd built environments. I'd been a, a computer games artist, mm-hmm. but I, and I'd only started getting into script writing um, the year before, actually, for Core doing uh, Fighting Force Two. Um, and Tom Scott, of course, was the mm-hmm. you know the other the, the programmer I could actually talk to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we could talk. We, we could talk a language that seemed to be approximately the same. No, he's great, Tom. Yeah, it's, um, it's but, yeah basically, Rich. Rich <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, at this point, Core was working on the sixth Tomb Raider game. What was the composition of the team like? Um, and how big was it in comparison to past teams? And how did that change development? I think... Angel of Darkness was about 45 people. I could be wrong, but it, it did definitely swell, especially in the, the, the sort of latter half of that development cycle. Um, one of the, the problems was the PlayStation 2 development kit that we had in the beginning was more like a PlayStation 3. It was a lot more powerful than what the, the actual PlayStation 2 became. Mm. Uh, they, they kept pairing it back. So basically we didn't know what level of detail we we were meant to be building to. Uh, A lot of the uh, video sequences from the original PlayStation 1 Tomb Raider were a lot higher polygon than than the actual in-game stuff. So we felt if we aimed for something like that, then we we might be able to get away with it. And we kind of did, to be honest. The the in-game Lara for Angel of Darkness is, is pretty high poly for a PlayStation 2 game. It's That's funny it. to say that about the PS3 uh, standards at the beginning because I might be wrong here as well, but I kind of remember the um, the chip that was designed, originally designed for the PS2, didn't happen and it got yeah. thrown over to the 3. 
And what they did <laughs> too at the very last minute was basically put two PlayStation One chips in there yeah. because they couldn't get the finished chip ready in time for the two. Yeah, that was how the audio yeah. side of things ticked. Wow. I think the whole thing ended up like that. So, so we it were was a botched job on it. <laughs> yeah, we had to expand the code team. We had to have a much bigger art team because we had a lot more detail to to build into the environments of the characters. And yeah, it, it did get a little bit unwieldy because we we'd only been used to like what was it, twelve people, Joe? Mm. The, the the one I game. remember being like 10, 12, 12, yeah. Yeah. ten or twelve. Yeah, so it was uh, it was quite scary, but. Yep. And that still sounds lean to me because now you hear about these team sizes that like at some studios are like 200 or some some yeah. huge yeah. game companies they have three 400 like with the annualized games people on on a single game and, and it's you guys still had it was at that size that you still had a lot of ownership I would assume over what you were working on right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There were individual tasks. I mean, like, you know, one person is responsible for a character, you know, like there's I don't know how it worked with design because in the last one we, we chatted through these with the four designers talking about each designer his own level to work on. I mean, did that change for you, Rich? And last time on that one, did you um, one for a level? we still had, we still had, um, you know, we still like to give the level artists. They they weren't just artists; they were designers as well, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And we tried to do that on Angel of Darkness, um, even though we were we were building the environments in a totally different way. Um, we, were, we were building the environments a lot like how they're built nowadays, to be honest. Uh, whereas the original Tomb Raider games, they were just like Minecraft, as you know, just yeah. blocks. So, yeah, I mean, um, the map designs were kind of left loose enough so the artists had some, you know, creativity with that. And then we'd thread that into the to the story design and, and the game design. Um, Andrea Cordella, I think his name was, he, he was like the lead environment artist on it. He'd come from like... Um, an actual um, background of fine art mm. and, um, and and sculpting and all this stuff. Um, and it's, he was really good at getting the, the detail in the environments, even though they were fictitious, they were still quite um, accurate, yeah. Andrea was the one that, for, for some reason, I think I sent an email to Mona Pete, I think Tom did it, um, and I sent it to Andrea and he says, oh, yeah, give it, give it to me. I'll put it in the, in the Louvre. I'll just, there you go. And I didn't know he actually done it. It was 10 years later, somebody pointed out. I was like, whoa, what really happened? So, yeah. Is, is that the yeah. Mona Lisa that you're talking about? The, the yeah, Mona Lisa yeah, thing? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. What were some of the new gameplay mechanics that you guys were excited to include? So obviously Angel of Darkness was super ambitious when it came to like stealth, mm. RPG light, melee, the different melee stuff, interconnected areas and different levels, dialogue options, all of that. So, yeah. so yeah. What, were those the original ambitions? Were there even more than that? Or, or, or could you just talk a little bit about those new mechanics? Yeah, um, apart from the all the Curtis stuff, um, which, you know, is kind of legendary now because there was that much stuff that we wanted to, to add for him. Um, there was, you know, everything seemed to grow organically. Sometimes it was good for the game. Sometimes we felt it was, you know, starting to push what we wanted to do a little bit. Um, the, the sort of upgrade abilities, um, design, we didn't feel fully worked, but... You know, we, we tried to incorporate it the best as we could. Um, I think it was always going to have that bit of RPG, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the conversational elements, the, you know, running puzzles through conversations. And, you know, we wanted that. Um, but, you know, I think a little bit, the, the tomb raiding was, was lost, which is why we sort of fought to get some of that back in. And I think that's why... Um, to a degree, the second half of the game was was cut. Um, mm. I could be wrong with that one, but yeah, I think uh, we, we just had I mean, a lot to deal with. <laughs> my personal view is that Angel Darkness, even though it was received in the way it was received, I think it was still a ben You know, in certain terms, it was a, it was a benchmark to games that were to kind of by proceed that. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Come after that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely felt like a lot of the things and combining them all were sort of ahead of their time, which was like super cool to yeah. see. Um, and yeah, so that's always like a, a point of pride when people talk about AOD is the stuff that that it kind of pioneered putting together in all those unique ways and really expanding what Lara was capable and Curtis. I mean, back in 2002, 2003, there wasn't the 
the option for DLCs or patches, this, that, the yeah. other. So it was as it was. But if we, you know, if this was like 10 years later and you, yeah. and, and you were allowed to kind of release it as it was, by the time it was actually out in the stores, you could have patched it and this, that, and the other. And yeah. it would have been, you know, all of them little niggles would have been overlooked and, or not even existed. So, you know, it's, it, it was. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I played it with Murty and Ash a few years ago, and I look. I, 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 the first time I'd seen it played by anyone in a long time, and I was mm -hmm. really surprised at a, a game which was like 14, 15 years old at the time, how well it looked and how well it played. So somebody had modded yeah. the controls, and it was like, wow, okay. Yeah. It, it does, holds yeah. up extremely well. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds amazing as well. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so Murdy, specifically for you, um, and and I suppose Richard too, you were kind of involved in some of the the earlier story design, I think, correct? So, like, what was the process of like basically resurrecting Lara after the events of Last Revelation and giving it that fresh start? Um, and I'd love to hear if you could maybe recap the official events of what happened between the Last Revelation and Angel of Darkness. I know obviously a lot of that got cut, but like, what was the you know the short synopsis of what actually happened between those two games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I don't do short synopsis, so um, yeah, make yourself <laughs> comfortable. Well, what, 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 what? The first thing I did when I when I got there, I mean, I I had seen the game played in the the various games companies I'd been in before, <coughs> but I'd never played them myself. So what I did, I asked for any back information, any story information, and I I was given four big ring binder folders with all the the, uh, the written material, the background, the story, and so on. So I read all those, familiarized myself with all those, and I realized that, that with Lara being left in the tomb, there was, a, it was a, a great possibility for a chapter of story there, but I'd already pitched the Cappadocia, Nephilim, and stuff. So I thought, well, I'll shelve that for the moment, but I'll mention it in passing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and subsequently, the, 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 the whole um, Desert Lara, Lara of Arabia, El Hawa, um, that I've, I've spent um, a lot of time this year expanding that into a massive epic story, which fills in the whole gap between Tomb Raider 4 and, and um, Lara going on to Angel of Darkness. And I'm pointing the way to the fact that um, Angel of Darkness 2 would obviously take place in, in Cappadocia with Lara and Curtis. And uh, the character that was, again, only mentioned once or twice, Morgau, yeah. going to Cappadocia. But then after yeah. that, Angel of Darkness 3 would be Lara going back to the desert um, to, to try and find what, out what had happened to her tribe. And mm. I've not written that, but I've written a lot of the information about uh, Lara as El Hawa, the, the, yeah. uh, the desert wind. I love that. That's I love that. I think version. all you have to do is you have to put like the, the the synopsis out there, and Tomb Raider fans will run with it and and write their own stories and expand upon it. So like the the lore and the richness of the world has definitely gone very far in terms of what you guys created. So yeah, speaking a little bit about PS2 era, how did the next generation of gaming broaden your vision for the series? Like in terms of limitations did you feel like there were some things that you would have loved to include but maybe they were too ambitious or too much for that console even and also when it came to the sort of limitations was it just about the level of detail and maybe the size and scope of areas or was there more things that you had to sort of rein in pull back on um all of that <laughs> <laughs> all of the yeah. above all of the above um one problem was disk space um because we were building stuff um and i think the final game wouldn't fit on disk so we had to start messing around with with that stuff the the complexity of the environments um because we were using a new engine as well we couldn't get the same sort of um environmental size out of the engine at that point we didn't have things like streaming on you know live streaming levels and things like that so a level had to fit in memory or we had to do little, you know, loads throughout the level. And yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of things to overcome, uh, especially because the hardware kept getting sort of shrunk back as well through the dev process, but uh, <laughs> challenging. But on, the, on the plus side though, the graphics were so much better as well. I mean, like every game that came along, you saw a more curvy Lara every single yeah. time. Yeah, and each yeah. one was by far the best looking one. Absolutely. That one, I think, by far. It's yeah. just a simple body count, to be honest. But I mean, when you, I mean, again, like 
uh, it's been said already that people looking back from 15 years ago, the game 15 years ago, it just looks stunning even now in some re some regards. Yeah. But it was just, I mean, it just be a benchmark regardless well, yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely started something. But I mean, I do remember seeing the new kit coming in and seeing what we could do with new characters and new stuff. And it was just astonishing. And actually, the whole thing was that when Lara was built, the new Lara was built, it was, everything was thrown up before everything started from scratch again. So it was all everything it got redone from to try and make it a sort of a higher degree as well. And it's you know, I mean, I know stuff got cut out of it, but at the same time, stuff did up to such such a higher degree in the first place. Mm. I mean, the programmers were, um, you know exceptional in getting the frame rate to such a, a high running smooth uh, frame rate as well i mean in some ways they were you know they were like cracking the whip at us to to keep the framework <laughs> keep the frame rate up you know we we can't have it dropping we can't have it you know chugging it has to be smooth um you know and they managed to get the game engine running at, at such a speed that uh, yeah it, it, it was really really nice to play so what were some of the earliest ideas for Tomb Raider next gen before it became Angel of Darkness and so on? Um, I, we, we, Chris and I were talking about this. We remember hearing some really like dark things for Lara that like maybe her manor had burned down and she had a problem with alcohol at one point and like it was like <laughs> gonna be super dark. Like, do you have any other I ideas that you explored like that? Was that just a like brief moment or was that actually? I think that was just a Something reflection really of our explore. personalities. <laughs> Moments of madness, I think. Um, does anybody else remember the island idea that was one of the, the ideas getting thrown around before it became Angel of Darkness? That was um, where Laura had been kidnapped and she wakes up like in a, in a cell. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing you have to do is get out of the cell and then you find out that you've been on this remote island somewhere and you you're basically the the hunter becomes the hunted and there was like there's like a you know a billionaire's playground of hunters that were just trying to to hunt the ultimate prey and the whole wow. purpose of the game was this to get off the island game. yeah that was one of the the first concepts for tomb raider 6. the idea transfer across into the start of angel darkness when laura had no kind of yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Like the very start of it, yeah, because she's in the same situation, isn't she, I suppose. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was all set in one single location, basically, the whole the whole game, um, which I think is kind of mirrored in one of the the later Tomb Raider games. I was going to say, a, being stuck on an island and being hunted sounds yeah. kind of familiar. <laughs> I love that. But, um, so, yeah. yeah, so the manor burning down and her becoming like an alcoholic, that was just a flight of fancy that maybe, was it Adrian that mentioned it, Chris, in an interview? Yeah, I think, I think Chris, I think Adrian mentioned it in an interview yeah. once. And and yeah. yeah, that's another thing that eventually happened is Lara's manor did burn down. So <laughs> that's true. destiny yeah. fulfilled, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it is yeah. an interesting premise, though, her on the run and seeing her not in her element and all of that. So I can see, like, definitely the dark the dark themes and all of that. But, yeah, it's interesting to hear where, where it could have gone. I think we like where it ended up, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think at the, at the beginning of Angel of Darkness, she was kind of weakened and, you know, memory wasn't the same, her abilities wasn't the same. So that's why you had to, you know, train yourself up and get back to how you were, I suppose. And... Maybe that was a throwback to, to that original idea as well. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of any more, to be honest. Yeah. It Go fits ahead, in really well with the El Hawa material. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when, when, when she comes back from the desert, she's in a terrible state uh, when she hears about the tribe and she doesn't know the truth of it. So by the time she turns up in Paris, she's, you know, she's she's been really knocked about. She's, she's had a, a really rough time. Um, she said, you know, that a lot of people that she knows and loves have been killed. Whether they have or not is another story. Um, but yeah, that's that's the state she turns up in in Paris. And no wonder she's on a hair trigger with uh, Von Croy. You know, she <laughs> yeah. just got no time for his story at yeah. all. So yeah. Um, yeah, he gets it in the neck. Yeah. What was the mentor character called? Was it Kutai? Yeah. Kutai. Yeah. Kutai, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The the mentor that, that yeah. rescued Lawrence Kutai, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Putai, yeah. yeah, yeah, Putai. Speaking of Putai as well, of course, it was around the 10th anniversary, I think it was the 10th anniversary of Angel of Darkness, that Peter, you managed to uncover the cutscene of Putai and Lara 
Uh, yeah. I had no idea. I thought it was just out there, here, there, and everywhere. And I, I thought, you know, it, it was one of them. It was one of them cutscenes that started and then it got canned. And I yeah. also, I really want to kind of finish this off. So I put some music on. I redone yeah. the sound effects and posted on YouTube, thinking everyone's seen it before. It'll get about one view, and then I'll hit everyone's like, "Bang! Whoa! What's going on here?" You know, like tens of it thousands of gaps. views. You know. It was yeah. super cool to see. It filled in some gaps for people. So yeah, it's finding. Yes. I love the fact that we're still finding stuff years later, right? Yeah, like, was... And because there's such a wealth of things that could have been explored, there's just yeah. like a, a gold mine of all this fun content. All of this stuff has sort of made the fans the Tomb Raiders. It's like we're sort of digital archaeologists, sort of just going through all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. There was there was even an amulet, yeah. wasn't there, Murti? Uh, uh, a scarab amulet that was actually tied into the abilities and the uh, the upgrade system and that was all you know she had this amulet around the neck uh, and that's how yeah, she sort yeah. of got her powers back and all that was from the yeah you it, know, the Alawa. in the newly written el hawa stuff uh yeah she gets given an amulet it's not a scarab amulet anymore i've sort of i've taken it down a different route um, but yeah, she she's got this this uh, amulet which can r restore her powers, but she never never actually used it in Angel of Darkness, of course. Um, but yeah, and and the other thing that's that's possibly of interest, I mean, this is all out there, all the materials out there. But uh, we we actually didn't get to choose the title ourselves. I sent a, a list round asking everybody in the company to suggest titles for the for the Tomb Raider six, and they came up with some really very good ones very funny ones very obscene yeah. ones uh, very <laughs> jokey ones uh, yeah. but then it all went down to london and it came back and the, and the the uh, the you know the publicity people said right we've decided it's angel of darkness and that hadn't even been on the list so you know <laughs> yeah. it's a good title actually i think we preferred you know, the lost, we lost dominion didn't we i think lost dominion yeah, yeah. When we were recording the Angel of Darkness um, at Abbey Road, and the, and the conductor was going through the different tracks, you know, he, uh, for some reason there was a typo on Angel of Darkness. It was Angle of Darkness, and I remember, <laughs> I, I remember the um, I remember sitting in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the control room and hearing the conductor go right next to one chaps, Angle of Darkness. The darkest <laughs> angle. And from that one, it's called Angle of Darkness. Kind of works. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely that At that like, it, layer of science to to when yeah. it comes to marketing things. I'm sure it was like user tested and all of that, and market <laughs> tested to come up with that. But I get how it, it feels a lot more organic when the name comes from the dev team itself. But yeah, that's interesting. I like the I like the Lost Dominion. It as was well. it was it was a good title, of course, because it could mm. refer to either um, Lara herself or mm -hmm. uh, the Nephilim. I, I, I yeah. really liked it. Um, mm. they, somebody down there must have actually read some of the notes that were sent down. So I thought, oh, right, okay, now we can work yeah. with that. Angel of Darkness, that's great, that's great. Love it. Yeah, yeah. So this might be more sort of aimed at Murti. Um, how did the story evolve between your time there? Like, um, what were some of the early ideas that maybe you wanted to include, but they didn't pan out towards the final game? Um, well, I, I had an outline of, of the kind of story. I mean, the, the main thing was this, the idea of the Cabal, um, who were, you know, trying to um, bring back this Nephilim um, semi-corpse back to life um, and, and the various other things. But basically, uh, very often I'd sit down with Rich and we'd say, right, you know, how can we go with this? And I'd say, well, you know, I see the story going this way, this way, and this way. These are the locations. And Pete and Rich would say, well, we can't do that because of this reason and this reason, but we can do that because of this reason and this reason. And then we can put some gameplay and puzzle solving in there. Great, okay, so I can change the story a little bit uh, because, of course, I didn't write the dialogue for a while. And it was only when the, you know, the, the, um, the story and the gameplay and the puzzle solving were in place that we could even think about uh, going and doing yeah. the dialogue. I mean, I was working on dialogue all the time and having a, a whole load of dialogue as backup ready to go because I knew the kind of generic situations that would come up. Yeah, it was it was it was very good working working with Rich in that. Um, but of course, you know, we found out later on that all the plans for Cappadocia and everything were were too much, and so we had to bring Cappadocia to Prague, you know, we had to bring the, the big sarcophagus with the, yeah. the Nephilim mm -hmm. sleeper. Yeah. We had to bring that to Prague. And that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a major problem. 
um, you know, it wasn't a waste of any work. It was just uh, just changing the location a little a little bit. Well, quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we, we learn. I certainly learned to be very, very adaptable and, and yeah. you know, on my feet all the time. It was just like a geek fest. This <laughs> Indiana Jones is, is, you know, he's my favorite character. And obviously Tomb Raider working on that was the closest to uh, getting to make an Indiana Jones game. So when Angel yeah. of Darkness came along, we, we got to sort of twist that away from Indiana Jones a bit, but still kept it in there, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. Completely yeah. different locations to what I was used to, to building. And yeah, it was just... Uh, it was it was really exciting working with Murty and just finding all these different things we could do that, that had not yeah. been done before. Yeah. So <laughs> we're talking so about Curtis, um, yeah. I'd love to, to dive into that a little bit. When did Curtis come about from a narrative perspective? And um, I'm in particular interested in a lot of the um, the stuff with the, comes to animating because he was so unique. And I know so Angel of Darkness did have mocap, didn't it? Correct, Jer? In the cutscenes, yeah. In the cutscenes, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you just want to talk a little bit about animating Curtis? I'd love to hear about that. Well, I mean, if, as far as the, the mocap's concerned, it's the first time I actually saw it in action. You know, we saw, yeah. we saw this, the stuff, there's a stairwell scene running on the stairs, and we're all sat there going, oh, our, our jobs are finished, we're out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it. yeah. But as, as it turns out, things don't work out that way kind of thing. But, I mean, Curtis, I mean, uh, Mark Donald came out and then he actually, I was asking Richard this morning, Mark Donald actually made the models in the first place. Mm -hmm. And we saw some of the early models there. We saw some images. You might show them in the interview. In the yeah. um, there, there was a design phase of trying to figure out how he looked and that kind of stuff. And then once he was built and once he was in, there was there was a definite side of it where he had to try to just replicate what Lara could do because he was just like, you know, the male version of Lara. So he had to do yeah. her moves and stuff. And then it just, it's, it's it because it, it, development was quite a long process, to be honest. So it got to a stage where, um, I can't remember truly if it's just me coming up with ideas or design coming to us with ideas and saying we need to do this next and then they didn't fit in. But there was a lot of stuff done for Curtis, which didn't actually make the game at the end of the day. To do something, I mean, it's like we were talking before, but the, the team was quite big, but people still specializing in certain tasks. So just doing one character all the way through, it's, it's a really, really special thing to do, to be honest. But it was cool. I mean, there was there was a lot of stuff going there, which I mean, like in Paris section where the guns were gone and everything, and you know, it was more stealth and sneaking. We had, we had, Sneaking and looking around corners of buildings and like there's mm -hmm. coming ladders and there were so many things. And even little mini cutscenes. There's some cutscenes which weren't actually yet a mocap. There's one scene in a cafe, which I can vaguely remember doing a cutscene for. Chris is sat there, you know, he's looking very crisp, annoyed. Sorry. Yeah. And he's just like he's, he's swatting somebody away or something. I can't remember how that worked. Rich might know that one better than me. I can't remember how it worked. I yeah. think it was going to be a cutscene, but yeah, we, we liked the animation, so it was just it was just there anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, it was right. kept, yeah. But there was things like, like you had the motorbike scene where he could have done more with the motorbike, but he just he just sort of jumps down, jumps on the back of the bike, takes off kind of thing, you know. And that's, yeah. that was really it then. But yeah, there was a lot. I mean, there was also there was there was all the powers that we were supposed to have as well in the game. And you saw them in the cutscenes. You see there, and he's making mm -hmm. doors open and close, and he had all these various powers. But when it comes to the game, he sort of stood there like a wet squib sometimes, you know, saying, "I can't do it now." We, I can't we do just it. we didn't have time, did we? To uh, just didn't have the time. Programmers right. didn't have time to, to implement it. Well, that was it then, yeah. And the worst one was, I still call it the chapter, but I think it got a different name into the day, didn't it? It was Chira, Chira Guy, is it? Mm -hmm. it, changed it changed the name so many times. <laughs> it was Chira Guy. But, yeah. Yeah. The whole idea was you could, you could throw it, you could fly through the room, you could control where it went, like sort of, like, sort of you know, a mind controlled frisbee, I guess. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, catch it again. and it just never happened. And I was, in a way, I was a bit disappointed because you, know, you put a lot into it. Think, this is look so cool. It's so different. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And the control system was really nice for that. You know, you, you could sort of target an enemy. You could lock on him with the with the Chira yeah. guy. Then you could, depending on how much uh, stamina you got stored, you could target other That's enemies. Right. Yep. And then you release that, yeah. you release the fire button, don't you? And then it it would sort of take them all out and then come back to you. It sounds like Red Dead Redemption. Exactly. Yeah, I remember seeing a demo anim animation of that that you did, Jay, where because it wasn't in the engine, but it was like, this is kind of what we could do with it. Exactly, yeah. And yeah, it looked yeah. awesome. And <laughs> we never got it in. We never got, never got around. <laughs> but, uh, I just remember the uh, yeah the psychic abilities that he had, as well as the yeah. blade. There was the far scene where you could, That's right. you, you had to find like a safe spot, then you could meditate and you could basically fly out of your body and fly around the environment and sort of go through barred doors and 
unlock gates and even kill certain enemies, um, which, you know, an actual game did that a few years back. Um, Imagine, yeah. though, being able Where to you play the ghost. Without yeah. the limitations and being to include what, you know, imagine it was redone now and yeah. everything in there was what we wanted back in the day or what you wanted yeah. back in the I'm day. I'm just thinking about, there were, I'm just trying to, there were other stuff which just got dropped as well. I mean, back in the Paris section, we, the idea was toyed having these dogs chasing her, police dogs chasing yeah. Lara. You might hear them barking in the background, they're after you. I remember yeah. doing animations with dogs, you know, scabbing over like 10 foot high walls, jumping down and chasing you. And then there was some one to one close combat stuff. Yeah. Which was yeah. all taking out policemen from behind, you know, stealthily, I suppose. Although yeah. One, one was quite violent. Yeah, she takes it out, you know, she stabs him afterwards. Like, but there was, I just think about there was the more I think about it now, there was a more that we didn't actually go in the game, actually went in the game, I think, <laughs> which is a bit annoying. But, you know, it's just, it's yeah. the, it is what it is. It had, it yes, there was, the, um, there was the junkyard as well. That was a, oh, yes. an environment that, that got quite, uh, quite heavily started on, but never finished. That's right. Um, Can you talk about know. that a little bit in terms of what was going to be in there? Yeah, it's, I can't remember how it slotted into the story. I don't know if Murty can remember that one. But, uh, yeah, it was just, um, again, it was going to be lots of guard dogs and there was something um, sort of locked inside one of the car trunks that you mm -hmm. had to find. Um, so it was, you know, it was a lot of shooting, a lot of hiding from, you know, the security guards. And then you had to search for this object that was hidden there. But from that, I don't even know if that's right, Mertia. <laughs> but I know we, we were going to build a junkyard. It, yeah, it sound, that yeah. sounds about right to me. Um, I, I, yeah. Um, and I, I think a, a lot of what we wanted to do, we got chance to do in the in the nightclub, you know, with the the <laughs> flashing lights yeah. and when, where yeah. where Lara's going there to look for the um, that box, you know, the box mm -hmm. with the golden glow. I mean, the fun. nightclub so was an ideas. environment. The, the nightclub was a, a weird one because it was like, what do we do in the nightclub? Uh, and, you know, Murty had written it into the, the story. Was it Le Serpent Rouge? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. It was, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. We, we spent quite a few days just trying to thrash out what actual gameplay we could put in that nightclub apart from just killing baddies. And it was decided that we'd do the whole... Um, you know, animating lighting rig that you had to climb around and, you know, that that presented a massive problem for the coders because it was moving while you were climbing around it. And, you yeah. know, they'd, they'd never done it that before. It was such a so. cool setup. Yeah. It really was. It was so <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. It really was. So, Peter, speaking about iconic music, tell us, please, about the inspirations, the musical inspirations I think it just needed to be cheesy 90s kind of dance music, you know. I mean, I've, you know, I, I really, I've, even though I don't, I'm kind of seen as mostly doing orchestral work, I, I do really like electronic dance music. And um, I just wanted to make it as cheesy as possible. And I think partly of it was just as a joke to start with. And I just thought, yeah, that'll work there really well, you know. <laughs> Martin did Martin did a, a version of it as well. His, the second half bit, and we glued them together. And so it was mixed by DJ. And it just seemed to work, you know, you hit the switch, the music blasts, it just kind of drives you. So for me, it worked. It was just meant as a joke, cheesiness, and um, <laughs> and there we are, the Serpent Rouge. <laughs> have, have, you heard, have you heard the version that's called Surrounded by Green? Not the new one, but the old one. On the original, what happened was a few years ago, um, well, quite a few years ago, actually, a friend of mine called us and I couldn't take the phone call because I was doing something else at the time. And he left a voicemail and he was absolutely hammered. <laughs> so I, I record I record his his voice message, put it over the top of the Serpent Rouge, and you know go, Google it. It's out there on YouTube. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't know how I haven't heard of that, but Chris, we need to find it and put it in here. You know, everything sort of happened really quickly from the moment being told that we could have the London Symphony Orchestra at Abbey Road. Uh, and we, at the, at the time, well, I think we had about six months left to complete the project. Um, so we just got straight down to it, you know, and rather than kind of, I think we listened to some scores and et cetera, et cetera, and took some inspiration. But I think ideally, because we work with a real orchestra, we kind of wanted to put ideas that we've always wanted to be used within a real orchestra. Um, obviously, we're based them. Um, 
on on previous t- Tomb Raider themes. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Angel of Darkness theme is a is a remake of the um, Last Revelation theme uh, mm-hmm. in a different key for the orchestra. But it's um, yeah. we wanted to make it a little bit darker as well, obviously because of the theme of the game. Um, but yeah, it was just basically okay. We've got a real orchestra. How do we make this? You know, we want to do this. You know, we want to do that. And it was most mostly based on how we want to manipulate the orchestra and to play the music. So it wasn't any real kind of drive from other tracks wanted to sound like this, wanted to sound like that. It had to sound Tomb Raider, but it also had to sound dark in, in a live format. So yeah, it was just really inspirational to do. I mean, being told you can use that orchestra at that studio. And that was my first time ever doing anything like that. It was just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I, I think my insides just exploded. It was, it was, <laughs> it, it was so exciting, you know, so. So how did you go about making these themes? Were you looking at early gameplay footage and thinking about the music or was it earlier maybe you were only given concept art or told about the themes like within the story and just sort of told to go wild kind of i mean that's that's pretty much how it works throughout throughout the the, the, the tomb raiders um i mean i don't know why i keep referring to this one but there was a level on tomb four and i remember watch i remember it was just one room at the time i remember walking around playing about just getting the kind of feel for it and then i would just place my hands over the over the piano or a keyboard with strings and see what come out and look at the screen and okay that works with this that works with that then record it and that's pretty much how you know we come up with the themes for Angel of Darkness we would just <clears throat> obviously we would take inspiration from the previous games a lot of the themes come from Tomb Raider 4 and Tomb Raider 5 but there are some new themes in there as well and we would literally yeah we would look at early kind of renditions of levels of um, concept art and just try and make it sound right. I mean, to be honest, a lot of the cutscenes were done a long time after we wrote the music, but miraculously, and I really can't, I still can't comprehend this, when we dropped the music that was done before the cutscene into the cutscene, it just seemed to work. So it was like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So it, it was just one of them things. Even like when it changed scene, it changed beat, it was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing as well that I noticed about the music, and I don't know if it was like intentional. Um, I've always felt like the music had this sort of military vibe to it, like this sort of marching band percussion. Was that a, a deliberate decision? Um, a lot of the percussion in the, in the Darkness Recons are, are too loud. So maybe that's why. Uh, I remember obviously we had very limited time to record it. I think we recorded about 40 minutes of um, soundtrack in about two, three hours. So literally, the the, 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 the symphony orchestra, London symphony orchestra would come in, never seen the music before, would have a little rehearsal, and then record it. I mean, the, the Angel of Darkness theme was the second take, I think, or the third take. Um, Angel of Darkness, wasn't it? Wow. <laughs> Angel of Darkness. I forget the yeah, yeah. In my, I mean, looking back, um, yeah, the, the, the percussion could have been a lot quieter, and I think that's probably what dry, sound, makes it sound a little bit more military because there's a lot of snare drums going on in there. Which should have been a bit undertone, but the tend to have turned out overtone. I'm curious about that. How did how did the orchestra actually and the conductor react to the music? Because you know, not many games were doing scores like this at the time, and like, were they surprised that this was for a video game? Did they did, yeah. did they like what we're doing a video game? Lara Croft. This is the music, you know. They were, yeah, they were pretty well surprised. I mean, the guy that recorded the music, he went to do Lord of the Rings and things like that. So we had some pretty good people up there. And the the composer, it's not the composer, the conductor of the London Symphony Orchestra, he was, um, he's been with them for about 50 years. So he knows the orchestra really, really, really well and how they work. You know, he took the score and kind of made it his own, you know, mm. um, especially in the Angel of Darkness, Angle of Darkness, sorry. If you listen to the music on that, it slows down, speeds up quite a lot. And I think that's his yeah. feel on his drive and that's what the conductor does. Um, but yeah, they, they literally just kind of came in it, it, the surreal part for me was when they came in, they were tuning up and kind of getting ready, etc. Et they were going through the scores and playing harp runs and trumpet bits, and I'm thinking, hang on, I recognise. Oh, right, okay, yeah, that's from Angel of Darkness. <laughs> so it was quite surreal to hear all that. And the actual Angle of Darkness music, that, um, that I think that the theme tune, I think it was the same, maybe it was the third version that they, they, they took. The problem with the previous ones was the harp at the end, the last note you hear was out of tune. 
I mean, now you could just tune that, it wouldn't be a problem, but we're like, oh, God, oh, it's no. so great, <laughs> but that yeah. hot tune was like a, like a 25 cents out, so we had to redo <laughs> that, but I actually stood in the um, hall, in the room, to listen to that, and that was the first time, and the only other time I've actually stood in the hall where it was being performed, and, and seriously, on CD, it sounds nothing like it, you know, it's, yeah. uh, uh, to see it for real, it's, yeah. it's like, multiply the experience by 100, you know, it's, mm. it's unreal. So we're going to be moving on to a little section called the cutting room floor. We really want to know some more about some of the things that didn't make it into the full game. Of course, we really want to talk about Castle Kriegler and Turkey, Cappadocia. How much of these things were actually built before sort of being cut? Well, let's start with you, Richard. Yeah, I mean, like, no they, were actually, they were actually built out. Like, as, as we're showing here, um, we, we found some yeah. really nicely rendered... Uh, areas of Castle Kriegler and a lab yeah. in Cappadocia, um, like a some sort of lab, which is really neat. So how much of them were built out and what was the intent in terms of gameplay in those spaces? Yeah, the the, the environments that you saw um, the images of, they were like really early prototypes. So they, they didn't have a lot of the, you know, the texturing fidelity or the, the light mapping, like the image that's behind Chris, that's like mm -hmm. a fully light mapped. Yeah. You know, the texture fidelity is amazing. It's got light rays. So the, the prototype environments that were done for Cappadocia and Castle Creek, they were like a, a little snapshot. So that stairway was the only real room that existed for that. And the same for, for, for Cappadocia. I think, um, I think those environments were going to be built up until about halfway through the project. So Castle Kriegler was going to be um, a little bit like the Louvre, as far as I can remember. It was basically where you were sneaking around. It, it had the typical castle secret fireplace door yeah. thing. And, you know, it was like meant to be paying homage to all the, you know, the spooky castles and, you know, the stuff from Indiana Jones as well, because obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you have to, don't you? So, <laughs> so yeah, um, Castle Kriegler was that. Cappadocia was going to be um, not just like in, in the lab, but uh, tunnels, caverns, you know, lots of um, trap dodging and, you know, fighting animals as well as the cabal. Um, yeah. But again, it didn't get fully fleshed out as to what the actual puzzles were going to be, what the gameplay was going to be. Um, I remember having a meeting with Murty when we were starting to talk about the sequel to Angel of Darkness. And I actually built um, what was to be the the the, Nef uh, the Nephilim transit system or something like that to take <laughs> you further into the caves of Cappadocia. Yeah. And it was like a, a Jules Verne gondola that was sort of riding on these, uh, these overhead tracks that went above like lava pits and stuff and you jumped from gondola to gondola and there was creatures coming out and attacking you and that was like uh, that was the concept for one of the first levels yeah. of, of the sequel that never got made so yeah that would have been uh... i'm like mind blown right now like by any chance do you still have any of these old files sort of lying around anywhere <laughs> I wish I feel I like did. that's a question I, for anything we I talk about. Like, do you have these? Yeah, I probably got them somewhere, but I haven't got them to hand. I'd have to, to have a look in the loft. Um, the trouble is with storing stuff like that, it can get corrupted as machines get older. You know, hard drives are notoriously bad, aren't they? Uh, but if yeah. I've got it, I will, I will definitely share it. Of course, as well, we've got to mention the E3 demo from 2002, or maybe 2003. In terms of the Hall of Seasons, it seemed like there was an entire alternative version built with that huge pool of water in the centre instead of the the platforms that raised and they had that massive Lux Veritatis knight statue and Lara would swing off a flagpole and bounce off it. I think again, um, did you animate that, Joe, actually? Did you animate uh, that? I need recollection, I'll be honest, but I think it might have been a quick thing just for, just for the show. Yeah, but... I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we just had to put something together, didn't we? So we just took bits of the environment that we got and, and you know, animated that sequence. But um, no, I don't think that was specifically going to be used. I think it was for the for the demo more than anything. Yeah. 
It's so it's so fascinating because I find a lot of times these demos or the things that were like the, the Tomb Raider 3 demo, right? And all these other things, they become like the holy grail for fans trying to track down because a lot of times they were bespoke, right? Yeah. Like it feels like they were things created just for these events and they can't see them. So I do have a folder that I found that's called E3 Maps in our AOD <laughs> archive. And I'm working with some community members and we're trying to figure out, like I said, uh... we had to archive.org uh maya 5 and actually start using like older programs that they don't support anymore to try to open these but maybe maybe we'll be able to get something out of it we're trying we want to be able to show off some of the e3 demo to people but yeah it looked like it was really cool excellent yeah yeah no it was it was nice to work on just to get some flavor of the game in there so we were going to move on to one of the last questions, which is basically talking about the future and what it was going to hold for the AOG trilogy. And then a Curtis, there was going to be a Curtis spinoff series, right? Which is one of the reasons he was so fully developed in terms of ideas like the, the, the interesting um, features and gameplay mechanics and so on he had. So I don't know if this feels like a very murdy question, but everybody else can chime in too. Like what was the future going to hold after that? Well, yes, uh, the, the idea was to, you know, get him, get him into a game where he could actually use his, uh, his abilities that had been so much time and energy spent on developing. There was a lot of stuff that was prepared and a lot of it was tied into the follow on to Angel of Darkness, Angel of Darkness 2, uh, you know, various titles for that and 3. But um, yeah, sadly, I mean, one of the, one of the um, little uh, tidbits that might be of interest was that um, I wanted to call Curtis Vance Renner. I was mm. very keen to call that one of the very one of the very few exchanges I had with uh, with um, Jeremy, and he said, "Oh no, we're not having that. No, no, uh, somebody's come up with Curtis Trent. We're, we're, we're going to go with Curtis Trent." <clears throat> okay, Jeremy, that's fine. And then <laughs> and then I thought, "Oh, KT, nice, nice Templar. Oh yeah, that's good. Uh, that's a nice link." Oh, cool. Yeah. With that. yeah. So. Um, so I used a lot of the um, alternative ideas that I had, Curtis, his, his uh, early life, his adventures. Um, I've written a lot of that material since, and he uses the various um, identities. Uh, you know, he actually ends up working for the agency, the Cabal agency at one point, um, mm. as... Um, Jacks, Jacks, but not Twain. Uh, they don't know who he is. They're looking for him, but he's actually working within the, you know, within the within the ranks. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of, yeah, a lot of these documents. I mean, I'll just a, a little little plug for my website here. There's a lot. <laughs> all that material is is, a lot is on there. It can all, <laughs> yeah. you know, it can all be found on there. All the all the ideas that never got used, some of the ideas that did, and a lot of a lot of new material, uh, all on the website. So yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's worth a look. Uh, yeah, that's great. Anybody wants to dive into that, that the potential for the narrative and all that, definitely go check out uh, Murdy's website, which just recently launched, I heard, uh, with the help of some amazing community members and so on. Uh, so it's such a great resource to check out and dive into. Cool. Yeah, some great music, some great music and some lovely artwork that's not by me. There, there's lots of <laughs> lovely artwork that is by me, but there's, certain, <laughs> there's lovely, lovelier, lovelier artwork that's not by me. So some great stuff on there to check out. Yeah, definitely. take a look. OK, we're going to go on to the last section just to finish up. Could each one of you tell me what you are proudest of from working on the Angel of Darkness and if you have Anything to say to the fans of Angel of Darkness? Now is your chance. Apart from the the overall, you know, game design, how the story worked out, how how we sort of threaded the story through the levels, which was backwards to how we'd done the previous game. <laughs> um, the Hall of Seasons, I built that. That was my favourite environment. Um, you know, it was it was really big. It had like you know, separate little puzzle trap rooms that were pure Indiana Jones, to be honest. So, love that. And uh, yeah. Yeah. What, what I'd say to the fans is, you know, um, you know, thank you for for staying sort of true and loyal to that to the game and and sort of seeing past its flaws. And and you know, people still follow it. They still love that aspect of Tomb Raider. And uh, you know, regardless what's happened before or since, you know, a lot of people still see it as their favourite one in the series, yeah. which kind of makes everything we did, all, all the pain that we went through, 
worthwhile, really. <laughs> so, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, this is uh, this is just, I'll try and say it's what I'm trying to think in my head. This might come out, come out very weird, but I'll see how it goes. But <laughs> when the game finished and Core was in trouble and Core split and half of us got taken away to a different company and everything, I really went sod Tomb Raider. I don't care about it anymore. I haven't even looked at it for almost 15, 17 years kind of thing. And mm -hmm. it's only working with Richard again now that I'm actually just going to get back into it, you know, being with Richard all the time. And when I did one of these, was it three or four weeks ago, with Megan, the other interview mm -hmm. we did? I mean, yeah. I've been looking back at it now, and I'm only now look, get, looking back at what we did before and how good it was, and looking at the Angel of Darkness over the last couple of days, before getting ready for this, like, I'd forgotten so much of it again, because I just I had nothing to do with the whole scene for, for this yeah. lot. I just didn't care about it. But looking back now, and even just from this interview, listening to the guys here now, you know, I'm seeing what I've done before. Now, I, was, I was very proud to work with the Curtis character. I really was. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, you know, fair enough. Stuff didn't make it to the game, but that's by, that's the way game development works. You can't say anything about it, but, but for the fans, I mean, also listening to the stories now as well, I had no idea there was this huge, big tribe of folks who are into this so much. I really had no idea about it. And fair play to them. If, if they liked the game that we worked on, and like, you know, I've worked on lots of games, but this, this is probably the big, biggest of, the, of, of them all by, by far, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got to say again, thank you very much for liking it so much. If you like this and you've got something out of it, then then good. Because it's like Rich says, we put a lot of effort into it. There was a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of hard work, and there's a long time making it as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, so so thank you. That's all I can say. Um, I can pretty much echo what Joe said. I mean, after uh, Into Darkness, everything went a bit dark. You know, excuse the pun, but it's... Um, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I couldn't bear anything Tomb Raider for about five to ten years after that. I couldn't even yeah. listen to any of my music. I would just like, it would just give us horrible inner vibes, you know. But, but to be honest, when I started appreciating it and I realised what sort of, um, you know, how great the community was, it kind of revitalised my love for it. Um, and now I can listen to the music and not cringe. I don't, it, it's what it's strange. It's very hard for to explain unless you've actually been there. It's like, you know. But I mean, I would probably say my proudest hour in Angel of Darkness is the um, Angle of Darkness theme tune. Um, yeah. I think that was probably the out of all the tracks that were um, orchestrated, I think that one was the one that was orchestrated meticulously. You yeah. know, there's nothing in there that I could, apart from the percussion, <laughs> that I could turn around <laughs> and say, you know, that could be better. It was, it, you know, it, the, the orchestrator, Pete Raid, he did a really good job turning the MIDI into notes. And um, I can listen to that and be proud of what's. What, what's been done. Obviously, that was a joint effort between me and Martin Iverson. It wasn't yeah. just me. Uh, Martin Iverson, Iverson takes half the credit for the Angel of Darkness music. So, um, yeah. Um. Um, yes, I, I my my response uh, um, exactly shadows everybody else's. I, I couldn't bear to even think about um, Angel of Darkness for years afterwards. Uh, I just, I got on with my own projects and was working on those. And it was only when people began to um, contact me and say, um, you know, start to ask me questions about it. I thought, oh, somebody's paying attention. Um, and, you know, it's quite a surprise to me. And, and here we are, you know, 20 odd years later. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's more popular than ever. And, and what I love, th th this, there's two things I love about this. It seems to have inspired so many people to write their own stories, do their own artwork, uh, do their own videos. It's fantastic the amount of stuff that's out yeah. there, and, and you yeah. know, I, I'm just yeah. I'm just in awe yeah. at the at the intensity and the the dedication and the enthusiasm of fans out there. But the the, the peak moment, the peak moment for me. I remember discussing this with you, Pete, when we were at Manchester in 2016, and we were talking yeah. about the peak moments, yeah. and you, you were talking about you know hearing your music orchestrated. And for me, the overall peak moment was being in the recording studio with Eric Loren and hearing, I mean, I'd, I'd heard his voice in the audition tapes and I knew he was right. But when he started to actually perform the lines, I just, you know, I almost flooded into tears. It was so perfect. And I thought, Curtis is alive. He's, he's mm -hmm. making Curtis a real living, fully formed person. And, mm -hmm. and when you look at Jez, um, fantastic um, animations that never got used, and, and you, you see, see the combination that what that character could have been. But yeah, that was my peak moment. Just hearing 
the, the first few lines delivered from Curtis and then the first few lines delivered from Janelle as well. But Curtis being, you know, basically my own creation, um, it was it was a peak moment. And, and I said to Pete, yeah, I think we've had similar experiences there. Those, those were the, you know, they, those were the class moments. Those are the ones yeah. that stay with me forever. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That is so cool. I love to hear that the community has almost been healing to some yeah, of you, like the, the process of yeah. seeing that. I totally, I mean, I, I totally understand having to take a step away and, and, you know, put some distance there, but then coming back and seeing that this world has been expanded upon and, and all of that by the fans and it's been kept alive all this time. And as you said, it's like more popular than ever. That's exactly, so exactly, yeah. Uh, this has been great talking with everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been absolute honor and pleasure speaking to each one of you I'm, I might feel my face is going to break from smiling too much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the invite. It's been an absolute pleasure as well. Yeah, thanks for oh, thanks yeah, for asking thank me you. to come I mean, on. Yeah, it's like I said. I mean, it's, I forgot about it for twenty years, kind of thing. It's such a cool thing doing these things now. Awesome. And it's, it's, you always look back with happy memories. You, you forget all the bad stuff and the hard yeah. stuff, don't you? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Richard having yeah. hair, that kind of stuff, yeah. you know. <laughs> I don't think I'm a brush hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just stole my hair. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the risk of seeming unnecessary, um, the future's ahead of us. I mean, there's so much material out there that could be used or reworked or, you know, other games and so on. So, you know, um, it'd be interesting to see what happens if anything actually does get taken up from any of the Angel of Darkness possibilities, remade or whatever. But, you know, it's very exciting. There's a lot of stuff out there and a lot of people working with uh, Angel of Darkness ideas. And it's, yeah, very, very reaffirming. Wonderful. Yeah, cool. amazing. Cool. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been great talking with you. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we can talk thank to you again you. in like thank another you. 10 years. And yeah, yeah. who knows well, what will happen <laughs> between now and then. All right, no, cool. No, thank you very much for that. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, then. Speak soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.